Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Very shortly uh, after the election, the Trump campaign recognized that they had likely lost the election, and they informed Donald Trump of that fact. Even before the networks called the race for President Biden on November 7th, his chances of pulling out a victory were virtually non-existent, and President Trump knew it. Do you know if anybody ever told the president that he had lost and that there wasn't a chance of him winning? The, I know that the president, when the networks called it, of course, he was informed about the, the network uh, decision. Um, that afternoon, at some point, myself and a handful of other folks went over and sat down with the president and um, communicated uh, that the, the odds of us prevailing in legal challenges uh, were very small. You know, after the election, as of November 7th, in your judgment, what were the chances of President Trump winning the election? After that point? Yes. None. At times, President Trump acknowledged the reality of his loss. Although he publicly claimed that he had won the election, privately, he admitted that Joe Biden would take over as president. Here's a few examples of that. So we're in the Oval and there's a discussion going on. And the president says, I think it's, it could have been Pompeo, but he says words to the effect of, yeah, we lost, we need, we need to let that issue go to the next guy, meaning President Biden. I remember maybe a week after the election was called, I popped into the Oval just to like give the president the headlines and see how he was doing. And he was looking at the TV and he said, can you believe I lost to this effing guy? Mark raised it with me on the 18th. And so following that conversation where the motorcade ride driving back to the White House, and I had said, like, does the president really think that he lost? And he said, you know, a lot of times he'll tell me that he lost, but he wants to keep fighting it. And he thinks that there might be enough to overturn the election, but, you know, he, he pretty much has acknowledged that, he, that he's lost. Knowing that he had lost and that he had only weeks left in office, President Trump rushed to complete his unfinished business. One key example is this. President Trump issued an order for large-scale U.S. troop withdrawals. He disregarded concerns about the consequences for fragile governments on the front lines of the fight against ISIS and al-Qaeda terrorists. Knowing he was leaving office, he acted immediately and signed this order on November 11th, which would have required the immediate withdrawal of troops from Somalia and Afghanistan, all to be complete before the Biden inauguration on January 20th. As you watch these clips, recall that General Keith Kellogg was the National Security Advisor to the Vice President and had served as Chief of Staff to the National Security Council for President Trump. And General Milley was the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon. Are you familiar with a memo that the President reportedly signed on November 11, 2020, ordering that troops be withdrawn from Afghanistan and Somalia? Yes. So I think you might have seen some things where um, there's a memo or something from Johnny McEntee to Douglas McGregor. Um, it says, here's your task uh, to get U.S. forces out of, uh, out of uh, Somalia, get U.S. forces out of Afghanistan. When you first interviewed and met Colonel Douglas McGregor, is it fair to say you discussed this decision of withdrawing from Somalia and Afghanistan, correct? Yeah, I'm sure that was part of it, yeah. And that was, it, the position that he was taking over there was senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense, is that correct? Yes. So on that same day, just so I'm clear, he responded back to you that they, meaning DOD leadership, was not going to do take any of those steps without an order. Without a directive, yeah. I explained in, in language that should be in the order while I was in the meeting with McEntee. And this was my answer to him. I said, if you want this to happen, or if the president wants this to happen, he's got to write an order. So you and never wrote this down in any capacity? I, I sketched on a piece of paper for him some key statements. Uh, you know, the president directs. Yeah. You know, this is... Uh, 
What's the right word? Boilerplate language? Who was in his office drafted the order? It was uh, myself and one of my assistants. McEntee duly types it up, brings it in to the president. The president signs it, and boom, it's over, faxed over, or emailed, scanned over to Castro, delivers it to me. Was it by auto pen, or was it the president himself signing it? It was the president. And who obtained that signature? I did. It is odd. It is non-standard. It is potentially dangerous. I personally thought it was militarily not feasible, nor wise. And I proceeded to tell the PPO and proceeded to tell McGregor that if I ever saw anything like that, um, I would do something physical. Because I thought what that was then was a tremendous disservice to the nation. And no, by the way, that was a very, very contested issue. There were people who did not agree with getting out of Afghanistan. I appreciate their concerns. An immediate de departure that that memo said would have been a catastrophic. It's the same thing what President Biden went through. It would have been a debacle. Keep in mind, the order was for an immediate withdrawal. It would have been catastrophic. And yet, President Trump signed the order. These are the highly consequential actions of a president who knows his term will shortly end. At the same time that President Trump was acknowledging privately that he had lost the election, he was hearing that there was no evidence of fraud or irregularities sufficient to change the outcome. I remember um, a call with uh, Mr. Meadows where Mr. Meadows was asking me what I was finding and if I was finding anything. And I remember sharing with him that we weren't finding anything that would be sufficient to um, change the results in any of the key states. When was that conversation? Probably in November, mid to late November. I think it was before my child was born. And what was Mr. Meadows' reaction to that information? I believe the words he used were, so there's no there there. It would be our job to track it down and, and, and come up dry because the allegation didn't prove to be true. And we'd have to, you know, relay the news that, yeah, that, that, that tip that, that you know, someone told you about those, those votes uh, or that fraud or, you know, uh, nothing came of it. Um, that will be our job as, as, as you know, the truth telling uh, squad and, you know, not, 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 not a fun job to be, you know, it's much, it's, uh, it's an easier job to be telling the president about, you know, wild allegations. It's a harder job to be telling him on the back end that, yeah, that's, that, that wasn't true. What was generally discussed on that topic was whether the fraud, maladministration, abuse, or irregularities, uh, if aggregated and read most favorably to the campaign, would that be outcome determinative? And um, I think everyone's assessment in the room, at least amongst the staff, Mark Short, myself, and Greg Jacob, was that it was not sufficient to be outcome determinative. Look, it's the right of any candidate to litigate gen genuine election disputes. Nobody argues that. But President Trump's litigation was completely unsuccessful. In our past hearings, we told you that the committee had identified a total of 62 election lawsuits filed by the Trump campaign and its allies between November 4th and January 6th of 2021. Those cases resulted in 61 losses and only a single victory, which did not affect the outcome for any candidate. The claims were not supported by any sufficient evidence of fraud or irregularities. In fact, they were baseless as judges repeatedly recognized. In none of these 62 cases was President Trump able to establish any viable claims of election fraud sufficient to overturn the results of the election. In those hearings, we shared with you the words used by judges around the country in rejecting the Trump campaign's claims. It's strong language criticizing the lack of evidentiary support 
for the claims of election fraud in those lawsuits. For example, a federal appeals court in Pennsylvania wrote, quote, charges require specific allegations and proof. We have neither here. A federal judge in Wisconsin wrote, quote, the court has allowed the former president the chance to make his case and he has lost on the merits. Another judge in Michigan called the claims, quote, nothing but speculation and conjecture that votes for President Trump were either destroyed, discarded, or switched to votes for Vice President Biden. A federal judge in Michigan sanctioned nine attorneys, including Sidney Powell, for making frivolous allegations in an election fraud case, describing the case as a historic and profound abuse of the judicial process. Recently, a group of distinguished Republican election lawyers, former judges and elected officials, issued a report confirming the findings of the courts. In their report entitled Lost, Not Stolen, these prominent Republicans analyzed each election challenge and concluded this. Donald Trump and his supporters failed to present evidence of fraud or inaccurate results significant enough to invalidate the results of the 2020 presidential election. On December 11th, Trump's allies lost a lawsuit in the US Supreme Court that he regarded as his last chance at success in the courts. A newly obtained Secret Service message from that day shows how angry President Trump was about the outcome. Quote, just FYI, POTUS is pissed. Breaking news, Supreme Court denied his lawsuit. He is livid now. Cassidy Hutchison, an aide to Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, was present for that conversation and described it in this way. This is the day that the Supreme Court had rejected that case. Mr. Meadows and I were in the White House residence at a Christmas reception. And as we were walking back from the Christmas reception that evening, the president was walking out of the Oval Office, so we crossed paths in the Rose Garden Colonnade. The president was fired up about the Supreme Court decision. And so you know, I was standing next to Meadow, Mr. Meadows, but I stepped back, so I was probably two, three feet caddy corner from a diagonal from him. You know, the president's just raging about the decision and how it's wrong and why didn't we make more calls and you know, just his typical anger outburst at this decision. And the president said, he had, I put the, the, so he had said something to the effect of, I don't want people to know we lost, Mark. This is embarrassing. Figure it out. We need to figure it out. I don't want people to know that we lost. Our country is a country of laws where every person, including the president, must follow the law and respect the judgment of our courts. President Trump's closest advisors held that view both then and now. Well, do you believe the president should abide by the rulings of the courts? Oh, yes. We, we, we should all comply with the law at all times to the best of our, our ability, every one of us. So once the courts had ruled and the Electoral College had met, uh, the election was over in your view? Yes, I think I think I've said previously that when the vice president made the certification and the litigation was complete, it was complete. When the Electoral College met on the 14th? Uh, yes, it, it, that is a December 14th, is that right? I think that's the, the right date, yes. I assume, Pat, that you would agree the president is, is um, obligated to abide by the rulings of the courts. Of course. And, and I assume you also would... Everybody, everybody is obligated to abide by the rulings of the courts. And, and I assume you also would agree the president has a particular obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That is one of the president's obligations, correct. Ivanka, do you, do you believe the president's obligated to abide by the rulings of the courts? I do. By mid-December of 2020, President Trump's senior staff were attempting to persuade him to concede the election outcome. But, but if your question is, did I believe he should concede the election at a point in time? Yes, I did. December 14th was the day that the state certified their votes and sent them to Congress. And in my view, that was the end of the matter. Uh, I didn't see, uh, you know, I, I thought that 
uh, this would lead inexorably to a new administration. I told him that my personal viewpoint was that the Electoral College had met, uh, which is the uh, <clears throat> system that our uh, country is, is set under to elect a president and vice president. And I believed at that point that the um, means for him to pursue uh, litigation um, uh, was probably closed. And you recall what his response, if any, was? He disagreed. Secretary of Labor Gene Scalia, the son of late Justice Scalia, visited President Trump in mid-December and explained the situation clearly. And so I had put a call into the president. I might have called on the 13th. We spoke, I believe, on the 14th, in which um, I conveyed to him that I uh, thought that it was time for him to acknowledge that uh, President Biden had uh, prevailed in the election. But I communicated to the president that uh, when that legal process is exhausted and when the electors are, have voted, that that's the point at which that outcome needs to be expected. I told him that I did believe, yes, that once the, those legal processes were run, uh, if fraud had not been established, that had affected the outcome of the election, then unfortunately, I believe that what had to be done was concede the outcome. Not only did the courts reject President Trump's fraud and other allegations, his Department of Justice appointees, including Bill Barr, Jeffrey Rosen, and Richard Donahue did as well. President Trump knew the truth. He heard what all his experts and senior staff were telling him. He knew he had lost the election, but he made the deliberate choice to ignore the courts, to ignore the Justice Department, to ignore his campaign leadership, to ignore senior advisors, and to pursue a completely unlawful effort to overturn the election. His intent was plain, ignore the rule of law and stay in power. Mr. Chairman, I yield back.